Hey everyone, it's Professor Pemberton. In this video, we're going to finish up our discussion on the area problem, but also related to distances. So we left off at finding Riemann sums to approximate the distance and also net distance traveled given the velocity function of an object. So we're going to pick up where we left off at the definition of what's called area of a region. So the area, A, of a region, S, is the area under the curve of a continuous function f of x and we found out from the previous video it is a limit of the sum of the approximating rectangle areas so if you want to look at the right endpoints it's the area is the limit as the number of rectangles approach infinity of the n rectangles or n sub intervals using the right endpoints if you use the right endpoints, it is f of x1 times delta x, which was the width, plus f of x2 times delta x, plus all the way to the last endpoint, f of x sub n times delta x. And it's the limit as n approaches infinity, so we increase the number of rectangles for this approximation using right endpoints. It turns out that is the area under the curve. It can be proved that if this limit exists, that is the area under the curve f of x, from the left endpoint to the right endpoint, x equals a to x equals b, bounded by the curve, as long as, long as the function is continuous. We'll also get the same value if we use the left endpoints. And we saw this in the last video as well. The area under the curve turns out to be the limit as n approaches infinity, so as the number of rectangles increases to infinity, using the left endpoints, so L sub n, where you have n rectangles or n subintervals, the limit as n approaches infinity, but you're using the left endpoint, so it's f of x sub 0 delta x, where x sub 0 is the furthest most left endpoint, plus f of x1 times delta x, plus all the way to f of x sub n minus 1 delta x. However, instead of using left endpoints or right endpoints, it turns out that you can use any point, any x value, in any subinterval to find out the height. The height of the ith rectangle or ith subinterval is the value of f of x at any number x equals c in the ith subinterval. So that's saying if you take any x value between x sub i minus 1 through x sub i, including either endpoint, left endpoints or right endpoints, then you can find out the area under the curve. And these numbers, c, in each of these intervals are called sample points. c sub 1, c sub 2, all the way to c sub n, if you have n rectangles. So this gives you an idea of what sample points really mean. So this graph is a function, y equals f of x, we're going to find the area that's underneath the curve, bounded by the curve, and above the x-axis from x equals a to x equals b. Well, we could use the left endpoint of each rectangle, and so that the left endpoint is intersecting the curve. We could use the right endpoint, where the rectangle would intersect the curve at the right endpoint for every rectangle. But you could also use any x value between them. So this is what the x sub 1 asterisk where x sub 1 star is, this is c sub 1. So x sub 1 star is c sub 1. The first sample point could be anywhere in that first subinterval. x sub 2 star is c sub 2 through x sub i star is c sub i. And this continues until you get to the nth subinterval. x sub n star is c sub n. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on this. Just keep in mind that the sample point can either be the left endpoint, the right endpoint, or any x value between the two endpoints of the subinterval. Something else that is very useful when we write out sums is using sigma notation. So you might have seen this from pre-calculus. Sigma notation is a convenient way to write sums where you have many terms. So for example, we can use sigma notation to um, abbreviate the sums for the left endpoints and the right endpoints. 
So if you're using left endpoints, then we know from the definition of an area, it's the limit as n approaches infinity. This is the area, A. It's the limit as n approaches infinity of L sub n, which is the limit as n approaches infinity of delta x times the sum of the y values from the left endpoints that start at x sub 0, next one's x sub 1, and then f of x sub 2, plus dot 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 dot, all the way to f of x sub n minus 1 for the last um, left endpoint. Well, it's uh, cumbersome to write all these terms out. You can abbreviate this using sigma notation. So it's the limit as n approaches infinity, 1 or delta x, and then times sigma for the sum. The i is the index of the sum. It starts when i equals 0, and it goes up to n minus 1, and you have f of x sub i. So the sum will start when the index is 0 for the subscript, and it will stop when you get to the index is n minus 1 for the subscript, exactly as this sum would be. Or you can use right endpoints to find the area. And this is also a equals a limit as n approaches infinity, but this time we're going to use right endpoints for using n subintervals. So r sub n limit as n approaches infinity, delta x times f of x sub 1 plus f of x sub 2 plus dot 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 all the way to the last one, which is x sub n for the rightmost endpoint. Well, you can also use sigma notation to abbreviate this sum. So limit as n approaches infinity, delta x times the sum i equals 1 to n of x sub i, and it's just the y value, so f of x sub i. These sums are so important, they have names. So the sums, sigma, i equals 1 up to n, f of x sub i delta x, and sigma, or the sum, from i equals 0 up to n minus 1 of f of x sub i delta x. These are called Riemann sums. So let's try example two. We're going to let A be the area of the region that lies under the graph of f of x equals e to the negative x between x equals zero and x equals two. So we're going to use right endpoints and find an expression that represents the area as a limit and do not evaluate the limit because the limit will end up being extremely difficult. So since the closed interval is x equals 0 to x equals 2, so 0 comma 2, then we know a equals 0 and b equals 2 from the definition of area under a curve. Well, now we can find the width. The width of the subintervals is always denoted by delta x, and it's b minus a divided by n from the last video. So we'll have 2 subtract 0 divided by n, or just 2 divided by n. So the width of each rectangle or each subinterval is 2 divided by n. This means that x sub 0 is 0 for the left endpoint. The x sub 1 is 0 plus 2 over n, so 2 over n. x sub 2 would be 
0 plus 2 over n plus 2 over n. So you'll have 4 divided by n. x sub 3 would be 6 divided by n, and so on. x sub i for the ith um, x coordinate would be 2 times i divided by n, because it looks like you're multiplying by multiples of 2. 2 times 0, 2 times 1, 2 times 2, 2 times 3 in the numerator. So 2 times i in the numerator. All the way up to x sub n, which would be 2 times n divided by n, which is just 2, and that does match the right endpoint, which was b equals 2. Alright, now we're ready to find the sum of the rectangles area. So the sum of the rectangles, the area of the rectangles, is as follows. So we'll have r sub n using the right endpoints and n subintervals, and we'll let n approach infinity with a limit in a second. We have f of x sub 1, because this is the right endpoint, times delta x, plus f of x sub 2, times delta x, plus f of x sub 3, delta x, plus dot dot dot, all the way to the last rectangle, which would be f of x sub n for the height times delta x. Well, the function that we're referring to in the problem is f of x equals e to the negative x. So we can identify what the y values are. They're e to the negative x sub 1 delta x plus e to the negative x sub 2 times delta x, e to the negative x sub 3 delta x, just plugging in these x values into the function all the way to the last one, which is e to the negative x of n times delta x. Well, we identify what the x of 1, x of 2, x of 3, all up to x of n are, so we can make that substitution. It's e to the negative 2 divided by n for x of 1 times delta x, e to the negative 4 divided by n delta x, e to negative 6 divided by n delta x up to the last term which would be e to the negative 2 n over n delta x or just e to the negative 2. Notice that delta x is 2 over n from earlier so e to negative 2 over n times 2 over n plus e to negative 4 over n times 2 over n plus e to negative 6 over n times 2 over n, and then all the way up to the last term, e to negative 2 n over n times 2 over n. Okay, I'm getting tired of writing sums. You should too. So you can rewrite this to um, sigma notation. So r sub n is equal to, you can factor out 2 divided by n because it's in every single term. So 2 divided by n times the sum i equals 1 up to n and all we'll have left will be the e to negative 2 over n, e to negative 4 over n, e to negative 6 over n, plus e to negative 2 n over n. Well, keep in mind they need to be of i equals 1 up to n, so they need to be involving x sub i. So e to the negative 2i divided by n, because we found out x of i is of the form 2i over n, and that's what the Riemann sum looks like. So now we are ready to take the limit to find the area. So therefore, the area under the curve is the limit as the number of rectangles or subintervals approaches infinity of the right endpoint sum. So limit as n approaches infinity, 2 divided by n times the sum from i equals 1 to n, e to negative 2i divided by n. So whatever this comes out to be for this limit, that would be the area under the curve. But like I said earlier, this is an extremely difficult limit to find out. Okay, part two. Instead of using n sub intervals, we're going to estimate the area 
by taking the sample points to be midpoints this time and use four subintervals. So let's do some observations first. Note that n equals 4 and the width of each subinterval is delta x equals, we're still using the same function over the same closed interval, it's 2 minus 0 divided by n, which is 4 subintervals. So the width of each subinterval is a half. All right, before we go any further, let's draw out what this closed interval is so we can identify the midpoints this time. So the closed interval was from 0 to 2, and we are using four subintervals. So divide this up into four equal um, subintervals. This would be one, this was half, and this would be three halves, halfway between one and two. But we're not using the left endpoint or the right endpoint this time. We're using the midpoint. So the midpoint of the first subinterval, midpoint, midpoint, midpoint. So to find the midpoint, take the left endpoint and the right endpoint of that subinterval and average. Add them together and divide by 2, and this gives you the sample points. C sub 1 would be 1 fourth. C sub 2 would be 3 fourths. C sub 3 would be 5 fourths. And then the last midpoint would be 7 fourths. So this is helpful to figure out what is the y value going to be for the height of the rectangle? I need to identify the x values or the sample points for each subinterval. So this time the sample points are chosen to be midpoints. Alright, so if we use left endpoints, it's L sub n. If we use right endpoints, it's R sub n. Midpoint is M, capital M. But we're using four subintervals, so four rectangles, so subscript is four. This would be the sum from i equals one to four. So start with the first rectangle up to the fourth rectangle, or fourth subinterval. F of C sub i is the height of the rectangle times its width. We identified the width as a half, so it's the sum from i equals 1 up to 4, f of c sub i times a half. And then we can identify what this sum really is. There's only four terms, c sub, f of c sub 1 times a half, plus f of c sub 2 times a half, up to c sub um, 4 times a half. Okay, and then the C sub 1, C sub 2, through, um, C sub 4 are the midpoints. So M sub 4 is equal to 1 half can be factored out from each of the terms times F of the first midpoint was F of 1 fourth. F of the second midpoint, 3 fourths. F of the third midpoint. And then F of the last midpoint. Now, we know what the function was from the previous part. It was e to the negative x. So this is 1 half times e to the negative 1 fourth plus e to the negative 3 fourths plus e to the negative 5 fourths plus e to the negative 7 fourths. And if you calculate this, this is approximately equal to 0 0.8557. So this is going to give you an approximation for the area. It's not the exact approx it's not the exact area. This is still an, an approximation, even if we're using the midpoints, because there will be some area that will be above the curve and some area below the curve still. The approximation of the area. but this time it's using midpoints. This would be a little bit more accurate than if you use left endpoints or right endpoints 
and only four rectangles. Midpoint is still better than left or right. Okay, so then now that we know what the area problem is and how to approximate the area using um, approximation rectangles, now we're going to shift over to the distance problem. We're going to find the distance traveled by an object during a certain period of time if we know the velocity of the object at all times. So this problem becomes very easy if the velocity is constant. So this is something you, you may have seen in high school algebra or um, pre-calculus. If the velocity is held constant, then the distance can be calculated by using distance equals rate times time. That's if the velocity is the rate and it's consistent or constant. However, we know that the velocity will, will vary in most cases, so it's not as easy to find the distance that an object travels, as we're going to see in this example three. So we're going to estimate the distance and see how this relates to the area problem. Suppose that the odometer of a car is broken and we want to estimate the distance driven over a 30 second time interval. We take speedometer measurements every five seconds and record them in the following table. So we record the velocity or the rate miles per hour from the speedometer every five seconds up to 30 seconds. In order to have the time and the velocity in consistent units, these are all in miles per hour, we're going to convert to feet per second. So you can convert from miles per hour to feet per second by using the conversion factor. One mile per hour is equal to 5,280 feet per 3,600 seconds. And you'll have these values. Find an estimate for the total distance traveled during the 30 second time interval using the velocity at the beginning of each five second time interval or time period, and then using the end of each five second time period. What you should notice is that this is the same problem as estimating the area under the curve. that we were doing earlier. The function is the position function, y equals s of t, and we are still going to be using approximation rectangles. Of equal width. It says to use, it says to estimate the total distance every five seconds. So each time interval will be five seconds, so the rectangles will have equal width. We're going to estimate the total distance for the 30 seconds using the beginning time of each five second interval. Sub interval. Okay, again, that's a lot to write, but you should notice that if you're using the beginning of each five second interval, then you're using the left endpoints. So you're gonna have six sub intervals or six sub time intervals so L sub six would be the velocity at T sub zero. Instead of X's, we have T's for time, delta T plus V T sub one times delta T plus V sub T sub two delta T. And then they're gonna have six terms total. So the last term is V of T sub six times delta T. We also know that delta T is equal to 30 subtract zero divided by six, which is five second sub intervals. Okay, so let's make a sketch of what the 
time interval really is. This time we are using the left endpoint of each time interval. So we will have 0 seconds up to 30 seconds. Break it up into 6 subintervals, 5 seconds apart. So 5, 10, 15, 20, 25. And these are all in seconds, representing time. We're using the left endpoints first. So I'm going to mark these with little X's, telling me to use those left endpoints. I will not use 30 because it's not going to be a left endpoint of each of any subinterval. So then L sub 6 is equal to V of 0 for the first subinterval times delta T plus V of 5, delta T, plus V of 10, delta T, plus dot, 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 up to the last subinterval, which would be V of 25 times delta T. So we're going to obtain these values, not from any formula, but from the table. So the first velocity at 0 seconds was 25 times 5. The next was 31 times 5. The next is 35 times 5. Again, all these are coming from the table. 43 times 5, then 47 times 5, and then the last is 46 times 5. This will come out to be 1,135 feet, since we converted to feet per second. So now we're going to calculate the total distance using the end of each time interval. So again, that's a lot to write, but we know from the area problem, this is going to be represented as R sub 6, which is using the right endpoints, because we're talking about the end of each time interval. So this would be V of T1 delta T plus V of T sub 2 delta T plus up to the last, which will be V T sub 6 delta T. And the delta T is again 30 subtract 0 divided by 6, which is 5 second subintervals. So let's make another number line to figure out which values are we using for the heights of the rectangles. So this goes between 0 to 30. This is in seconds per time, and we are still dividing this up into five second um, subintervals. This time, however, we're using right endpoints, so 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, and the last subinterval we use 30 as its right endpoint. So now we can estimate using the um, notation R sub 6, which would be V of 1 delta t, v of 5 delta t, plus v of 10 delta t, plus v of 15 delta t, and we're going up to v of 30 delta t, which comes out to be, now we can again refer to the table to find these velocities, which will be 31 times 5 second interval for the width, 35 times 5, 43 times 5, 47 times 5, 46 times 5, and then the last one will be 41 times 5 for V of 30 times 5, which comes out to be 1,215 feet. So again, this is an approximation or an estimate. The actual total distance is somewhere between 1,135 feet and 1,215 feet. So if you increase the number of subintervals, 
then you will approach the actual total distance for the object, in this case was a car. So this finishes up our discussion on the area problem and how it relates to distance. If you have any questions about anything from this video, please let me know. Or if you have any questions while you work on the homework, please let me know that as well. And I'll see you at the next video when we talk about the definite integral.